In this episode of In-Ear Insights, we are talking about large language models and AI, but specific to the corner office, the big chair, the, the CEO. And that, of course, Katie, is you. When you look at the landscape of all the things that we talk about in AI and you think of it with your CEO hat on, what mm -hmm. are the things that you as a CEO need to know about um, in, order, in order to be effective? in order to understand the the opportunities, the risks, stuff. What is, what's on your mind when you think about all the stuff that I foam at the mouth at regularly? Um, you know, the first question I always ask is, tell me when I need to pay attention. And, you know, that's a loaded question because it depends on what the business is about, what the CEO cares about. So for us, you know, my questions more specifically would be, well, you know, will generative AI, will large language models make our business better? What does that mean? Will we have a competitive advantage if we integrate large language models into our business? What does that mean for my bottom line? Is there going to be a lot of cost upfront to get them set up? But then in the longer term, I'm going to save much more money than I invested into this thing. What does that mean for me needing to skill up myself? What does that mean for me needing to skill up my team? What kinds of resources do I need to consider? Um, are there legal implications for using this kind of technology? That's a question I have about any kind of tech that we bring on of what are the legal implications? What are the security considerations? Do, you know, we personally at Trust Insights don't deal with uh, HIPAA data, protected health, personally identifiable. We just, that's thankfully not the nature of our business, but those are, that doesn't mean that I don't need to be aware of what that means. So I guess, so to sort of sum up the first question I would ask is what information do I need as a CEO right now, today? What do I need to be paying attention to? Do I need to be paying attention to all the little startups who have their own version of a skin on generative AI, or do I need to be thinking bigger than that of, you know, what does this mean to bring a large learning model into my business period? I think it's the latter. When you think about la large language models, um, they're almost like kitchen appliances, right? You have mm -hmm. a, a brand new kitchen appliance. You don't know what it is. It just magically appeared one day, right? Someone, someone left it on the, on the counter for you. Your logical questions are, well, what is this thing? Like, what does it do? What's it capable of? You know, how dangerous is it? Is there a manual? <laughs> all those <laughs> all those things that it's very difficult to get that baseline understanding, particularly from, say, the mainstream news and social media sites, because everyone and their cousin has got sort of their perspective on it. And there's not really mm -hmm. a baseline of, here's Here's the starting points of the things that you need to know. Like, hey, a large language model is fundamentally a word prediction machine that is used for tasks that involve language, right? Uh, so even something as simple as like being able to understand, okay, this is a task that involves language and LLM is a good choice for it. This is a task that does not involve language and it, in any way, shape or form. And a large language model is going to fail spectacularly at it. You can't use the technology for it. Just like you can't use a blender to make steak. I mean, theoretically, you could do something with it, but it's going to be horrible. It's not going to be the outcome you care about. And so that to me would be where any CEO would want to start is, okay, well, explain this to me in terms of the opportunities and risks. What does it do? Mm -hmm. What's in it for me? And what can go wrong? It's funny that you bring up the blender because I was going to use the blender as an example as well. So uh, a few months back, my husband brought home this really nice Vitamix blender. And I looked at it. I'm like, okay, but what does it do? And he starts explaining to me that you can actually cook soup in it. It does this. It cleans itself. It has all these settings. And I as someone who isn't comfortable in the kitchen, I immediately started to get overwhelmed and I had to reframe the question to say, okay, but what do I specifically need to know about this type of machinery given 
the type of cooking that I'm going to do when you're not around to supervise me to not chop off my fingertips because I stupidly reached into the blender trying to get everything out of it, forgetting that there's blades inside of it. And so he showed me, you know, the two or three functions on it that I need to care about as the person, you know, who's going to be doing the work. And that's very much the same way that I would approach these conversations with another CEO when the CEO says, what do I need to know? You need to understand that particular person, that particular company, so that you can streamline the conversation down and get rid of a lot of the distractions. And so, you know, when I think about your large language model discussions, Chris, there's a lot of information in there. And thankfully, I've seen the talks and I talk with you enough that I understand all the pieces, but not all the pieces are relevant to me. No, that's totally fair. And the, the way I typically like to suggest people think about stuff like this is to to a, you, you do need to understand the technology to some degree, mm -hmm. right? Like same with the blender, like you, you do need to understand what the basic function of a blender is because it's it's not a frying pan, right? Um, right. And mistaking it for a frying pan, as you mentioned, could have catastrophic results on things like your fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. From there, it's asking people sort of where is the need, right? So one of the things that we talk about um, in our the keynote addresses we do, in the workshops and the trainings we do, is have people start looking at their organizations um, and, and say, okay, there's, there's sort of two fundamental vectors, right? There's stuff that you can do inside your company. I'll call this the internal square here, right? Things like your operations and finance and HR, stuff that you know, is, is happening within the walls of your company. And then there's all the stuff external that is partners, vendors, customers, the general public. So the first thing you, you would want to do is look at your company and say, well, where where is the need right now? Is it internal or external? And then the second dimension is optimization versus innovation. Are you tr are you looking to do things like save time or maybe uh, you know optimize headcount and stuff like that? And then you're in the optimization sector, right? So you're uh, or you're looking to uh, streamline customer service interactions, do what's called call deflection, where you, you divert call volume away from uh, your expensive call centers to machinery. Those would be examples of optimizations, uh, internal and external. Or are you looking at innovation? Right? Are you looking at net new things, new capabilities? Like, you know, competitively, there's no difference between you and the, the next three competitors other than the logo, right? But you all do exactly the same thing. Is there an opportunity to take this new thing and offer something new externally or internally introduce a new product line, introduce a new line of business based on the capabilities that, it, that any tool gives you? And so... That's how I would typically start a very high level discussion with the CEO. Cause he, other than just knowing the basics, you don't really need to know like tokenization and embeddings and transformers. That's, that's not helpful. It's mm -mm. look at the business and say, well, where are your needs right now? And I think that this is a smart way to approach it because even as you're mentioning, you know, tokenizations and I already forget what the other word was, um, you know, I can see and I've been part of a lot of conversations where someone will get stuck on those things like, oh, oh, so that's something I need to know. And they'll try to get so far into the weeds with that particular functionality that it's distracting to the overall goal of what it is you need to know. I um, this is something that I'll be talking about in some of my upcoming sessions at Mads and Marketing Profs B2B is that when you when a technologist is talking to a non-technical person and vice versa there needs to be some way to refocus the conversation so that you don't get stuck in the weeds of the technical functionalities chris you've explained tokens to me a bunch of times and for the life of me they don't stick in my head i have a general idea and i could probably describe it to someone but if i described it back to you you'd say okay so you're about 40 percent correct and 20 of that is how you spell the word token. And even that <laughs> I might get incorrect. And so I like the idea of focusing the conversation with someone in the C-suite, specifically maybe the CEO of before, when they say to you, what do I need to know? You kind of push back a little bit with more questions than answers because what they need to know is going to differ case by case. 
Yeah, I mean, can you imagine going to the doctor's office and the doctor saying, "You need this." Like, you haven't done anything yet. Like, <laughs> what do you mean I need the gallbladder surgery? Like, that's but I don't not, have my, type two diabetes. It's like my foot hurts, <laughs> and so <laughs> it's it's very similar. So, if you think, for example, just using Trust Insights as an example of our business as a CEO in these four quadrants, where do you think our need is right now? I would say our need is not internal. Our need is external. And our need is optimization. How so? Um, the services that we provide are foundational. Um, you know, we're not executing on campaigns. We're not drafting, you know, email copy and writing content for uh, our our clients. We're not ghostwriting. And so I would argue that those types of tasks, those more public facing things that you can actually see that are tangible are more of the innovation. I, you could also say that those are optimization, but I would say that our processes, the things that we do, a lot of what we do is data analysis is it straddles that line of innovation and optimization because it's innovation in terms of the techniques, but it's optimization in terms of getting to the answer faster so that you can take action on it. Okay. Okay. I think that makes sense. That's the kind of exercise that I think is really valuable because once you do this exercise, once you, you sit down and say, okay, well, here's, Here's where our needs are. We know this is the biggest area. Then you can drill into that. You can say, okay, well, let's say you know that you your customer service is just terrible. People, you know, your NPS scores are in the toilet. Um, nobody mm -hmm. likes you. You have two stars on Yelp. Whatever the whatever the the measure of success is, and you identify that that is an external problem, and it's not an optimization problem. It's an innovation problem. Like people just don't like your products and services. So you mm -hmm. need a new product or service. At that point, then once you, you know, once you unpack that, you can start. You can bring out the the five P framework and say, okay, well, we know from this this exercise what the purpose is, um, and now we can determine is a large language model or the AI technology of choice is it a good fit for that? Right? Mm -hmm. If you're if people just hate your company's products and services. That might or might not be a language model, a, a problem that you can solve with a language model. If people hate your customer service because they don't like working with your customer service reps, now you're into the territory level. Maybe a language model can help because maybe your your customer service team is is so overburdened that they can't deliver good service. But if you can do call deflection and maybe chop mm -hmm. forty percent of your call volume off, now your team has more breathing room to deliver better service. I remember talking to a, one person who worked at um, a, a major bank, and they're saying, "Yeah, we have to, we have to hard limit uh, reps' abilities to be on the phone to five minutes or less. Like they mm -hmm. they can't go over five minutes just because we have so much volume." I'm like, "Well, there's some problems you can't solve in five minutes, right?" And so your your CSAT scores go in the toilet because customers are just pissed off. If you could mm -hmm. deflect. 20 to 40% of your volume to a language model that can answer the easy questions like, what's the interest rate on my credit card? Or, hey, I'm going to be late with her payment. What do I do? And it can deliver good answers. Now you could say, okay, rep, now you can have 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes to solve a customer's issue. And you're, you'll just by virtue of doing that, your CSAT score is going to go up because people feel like they're getting better service. So that's an example where the innovation of a language model as an external service will help with the optimization internally. So these quadrants are also connected internally. Well, and so what I keep hearing you say, um, or at least what I keep hearing the theme be is we can't even get to what the C-suite needs to understand about a large language model because there's so much more work to do first in order to provide valuable information. So first and foremost, the C-suite, the CEO, the CMO, the CEO, they need to understand where there are, they almost need to do a SWOT an analysis first of like, where are the threats in the business? Where are there opportunities in the business? You know, maybe the C-suite isn't even aware that the NPS scores are in the toilet. You know, that would be the place to start. So first you need to surface up all of this information about what's going on with your business first 
you need to categorize it into, okay, we're doing these five things. Well, let's just leave those be for now. They're not a high priority or they're going to be really, you know, low hanging fruit, small wins that are going to do a lot of big things for us if we introduce large language models into them. And then we can refocus on all of the other things that aren't going correct. And so it sounds like what we're collectively saying is answering the question of what do I need to know about large language models is the wrong place to start. It's part of the conversation, but first and foremost, we need to understand what's going on in the business, both internally and externally, where there's optimization and innovation opportunities, where there's threats from our competitors, where our customers aren't happy, where things are going really well, what processes need improvement, but also what processes are just swimming along and working well. Then we can tailor responses to say, and now given all of that other information, this is what you need to know about a large language model. Exactly. So we had a, a consultation with uh, the president of one of our clients recently, and one of the key takeaways from that conversation was they they knew internally what was broken. Like they would, they had done that groundwork, and they know, like for example, one of the big, big, big things that they have an issue with is hiring. Right? We cannot hire people fast enough who are qualified to, to do this specific role. And that's an example where then you can say, okay, now that we know what the problem is that's got your hair on fire. Now, let's pick apart that problem, the, the people, the processes, the platform and stuff and say, is there an opportunity to introduce the capabilities of a language model so that it will alleviate some of the burden? And so in the case of hiring, for example, one of the bottlenecks of hiring is getting a you know, bunch of unqualified candidates. So how do you how do you optimize the hiring process? Are there opportunities for language models? Yes, there are with a gigantic asterisk. When, if you uh, would like to know what the asterisk is, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, um, the trustinsights.as slash YouTube, and watch our uh, most recent live stream on a gender bias in language models because that is the big asterisk with language models. But the ability to then take that, that known problem and pick it apart and say, here's where this technology can make a difference is... It's where the magic happens. I agree with that. And so, so there's a lot of work to be done before you even get into that conversation about a large language model. But so, you know, let's say, Chris, I came to you and said, what do I need to know about a large language model? And you pushed back and said, well, we need to do all of these exercises first. I can 100% of the time imagine that a CEO would push back and be like, yeah, 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 that's great. But I still need to know what this thing is. I need to understand the pieces of it so that I can start to think about how to frame these conversations. The Acknowledging that the challenge there is once you start to give someone this information, they are going to start to frame all of these conversations around whether or not they realize it, they'll frame them around this solution could because they think that this is already the solution. So that's going to be one of the larger hurdles is giving someone the information in such a way that they don't then already think, well, this is the solution. This is, this is what we're going to do. And now we need to retrofit all of our problems into this solution. The way that you can mitigate that to some degree is uh, again, it's not focusing on the, the mechanics of the technology, but understanding the use cases, the implementations mm -hmm. that exist in any given discipline. You know, again, in, in the keynote talk, we, we typically walk through uh, for any given industry or any given um, you know, function, the language models capabilities fall into six broad buckets, right? Generation, extraction, summarization, rewriting, classification, question answer. Those are the big six buckets. And so when you talk to somebody and say okay well you've got this problem you have an you have a, a, a candidate sourcing problem when you decompose that problem you say well is the are the processes that occur within that problem do they fit in any of these six buckets if they don't then the answer you know to the to the person's question is it's not going to help you here right if if it doesn't if the the process itself doesn't have one of these six functions as a core part of the process, a language model is not going to help. It's just going to make things worse. Um, so helping someone, when somebody says, well, what do I need to know? This this is the, the bare bones minimum of what uh, 
anyone would need to know about a language model. These are the six general things it can do. There are obviously use cases for every single one of them that are specific to the job that's being asked for. Uh, you know, for example, if you're talking about finance and the, and the CFO's, CFO's office, one of the easiest, biggest things you can do is say, okay, well, here's the new tax regulations for this year. Summarize <laughs> what's changed so that we can adapt our processes quickly. And that's a, that's a you know example of really low hanging fruit. Very, very easy mm -hmm. for a machine to do. Super valuable for the entire CFO office because they can go, okay, well, now we know we have to meet these new regulatory requirements. But it's contingent upon the CFO knowing, hey, tax law has changed. What do we need to know to be able to ask right. that question? But I, this is where I would start. When you would say, uh, what do I need to know? This is where you, this is what you need to know. And I think that that makes sense because you're not getting into the technical pieces of it. You're not talking about tokens. You're not talking about fine tuning. You're not talking about things that are relevant but could be distracting to that any to that specific audience um right. you know I, I would imagine if you're talking to the cfo and you start talking about tokens they may start because they are bottom line driven trying to add up in their head well if i only have this many tokens and this many people and this many times i can run the thing like what is that going to start to cost me over time given what we want to do with the thing like it can be very distracting it's all important information that has a time and a place but when you're introducing these topics introducing these technologies to someone who's unfamiliar with it you have to focus the conversation absolutely this framework is essentially more or less the cookbook right you don't need to know that a blender basically uses a series of electromagnets to power a motor that you know, a brushless motor to, to operate at a certain speed what you do need to know is don't use it for steak <laughs> use it for soup use it for smoothies definitely use it for margaritas don't use it for steak and so having this this sort of conceptual cookbook gets you to that for language models use it for this you'll notice on here nowhere does it say analytics right nowhere mm -hmm. does it say um uh, like double account double entry bookkeeping because those are not language tasks and therefore they don't fit in this language framework of what this tool can do and so even just understanding that distinction that will help reframe the conversation for uh, a CEO, a CFO, a CTO to say like, hey, Microsoft is going to be rolling this stuff out into Microsoft Office and, and it's going to be in Google Workspace. What are we supposed to do with it? Well, what language based things are you are you trying to, to optimize in your organization? What things do you have problems with that are not language? Language models will help with that. Language models will not help with that. So what if the CEO comes to you and says, well, how are we going to make more money using generative AI? Or can we make more money? Or, you know, can I let go of my whole sales team because generative AI can do all of this for me? Um, what if the CEO says to you, um, you know, I heard that Bob down the street, my biggest rival of a CEO and always beats me in tennis uh, is using generative AI. I want to use it too. I mean, <laughs> so to answer the questions about, <laughs> can I make, I, I can't fix Bob's tennis. Issues, I right? mean, that's, that's, you just, you need to get a better coach, I guess. Um, but we go back to, well, what's, what's most broken because fundamentally machines do what they they do things better faster and cheaper they they typically do a better job with most tasks than humans do for the same equivalent task they do stuff a lot faster than humans do and they typically do it much cheaper um so when you look at your two by two matrix of of the issues that you have in your organization one of the the ranking factors for deciding you know how you prioritize should be is this costing me a whole bunch of money or mm -hmm. am I not making enough money from this? So let's say you know, I used to work at a company that had a terrible, terrible sales team. They closed less than 1% of the opportunities they were given. Um, you could have replaced most of the sales team with the dog. And it would have come out. It probably would have closed more deals. The dog would have closed more deals because it just would have looked cute and barked. Um, mm -hmm. I'd buy it. I don't know what <laughs> you were selling, but I would have bought it. <laughs> um, and... So a big question there is, okay, well, great. So we know the sales team is the problem. It's an optimization problem. It's internal, but it's costing us a lot of money because it bleeds over into the external. 
because we mm-hmm. can't sell to people. Why? Because the salespeople themselves were not skilled salespeople. They were just randos picked up off the street. Um, <laughs> it felt that way anyway. <laughs> is that a language problem? For a good chunk of the sales process, the answer is yes. Right? They were they were they were doing the old grab them by the tie and choke them till they buy. Right? That which stopped working twenty years ago. Um, More than that, yeah. Yes. Can you use a language mo- model to solve that problem? Yes. By changing up what the salespeople say, how they say it, who they say it to. And now you're into the territory of, okay, this thing can make me more money. So it's, again, it's decomposing the problem to, to understand mm-hmm. what the problem is, understanding the people and the processes that are in place, and then saying, can the technology improve some of the processes? And in, in this example, the answer is yes, to a degree. You still should probably fire most of the salespeople because they're terrible, right? Um, you can replace 80% of them with machines and no one will know the difference because they're so bad at their jobs. To the, like, the other questions of can I replace X or Y or Z person? Well, not really a person per se. You can replace tasks for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a question that everyone should be thinking about is, well, of the tasks that I do every day, how many of them are language-based? And is there an opportunity to use a tool to help me improve the way I use language to accomplish that task? And if the answer is yes, then there's an opportunity there. And again, for the CEO, you're thinking about that organization-wide. In a given department like HR, how much of your work is language-based? How good is it right now? And then what are the opportunities to use language tools to improve the skill of which you use language? Do you think, and this is this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's still relevant because I can see where the conversation is going to come up at the C-suite level is, do you think that a company that is powered by AI has more of a competitive advantage than a company that doesn't? So for example, you know, we do a lot of data analysis. Uh, we do a lot of trying to understand what's in your tech stack. Just in your opinion, do you think that if we put on our website, you know, we are backed by artificial intelligence, our processes are AI driven, and then someone who does the exact same thing doesn't, do you think we have a competitive advantage? In this particular example, the it, it's a maybe. Um mm-hmm. Does a company that has it, the AI is like a blender, right? You go keep coming back to this. If you don't know how to cook, a blender is not going to help. Um, mm-hmm. If you know how to cook, but all of your, your line chefs are still using hand whisks and knives, will a blender make those already skilled cooks better and faster? Yes. And you will have a substantial competitive advantage over a competitor who is still using hand whisks and knives because your team can do stuff much, much faster. You can use fewer people maybe or get those people retasked to doing other things in the kitchen because they're not, you know, you'll have 10 people all chopping up apples. Um, And this is the exact same thing with, with AI. One of the things that we say often in, in the every. Thing because people that's the number one question people ask is, you know, is this thing gonna take my job? The answer is AI won't do your job. But a, a worker who is skilled with AI mm-hmm. will take the jobs, plural, of people who are not. So a company that is skilled with AI will have inherent op operational advantages over a company that is not deploying AI for any process that involves language. And I think that that's a really good distinction Uh, because it is, it's a question that comes up a lot. And then if you think about it from the perspective of the CEO, you know, there may be the, well, how much of my workforce can I replace with artificial intelligence? How much money can I save to look good to my investors by bringing in AI and letting go of 60% of my team? The answer is that's a terrible strategy. And it's more the optimizing the tasks and then rethinking the roles and responsibilities. Yep. Like in our case, we have, we don't have enough people to replace the machines, but what 
we are seeing and has been true for the the entirety of the existence of our company is because we are skilled and skillful with the uses of machinery, we don't have to hire nearly as many people to do the same amount of work. I mean, we, even just monthly right. reporting, the amount of reporting that we crank out for our clients should take a team of five to say five to eight people to do the reports that we do. Um, we do it with one person over the span of about two days. Um, right. And the report quality is as high or higher than what that team of five to eight people would do because no one's manually copying and pasting. No one's doing this, that it's all automated. Some of it's machine learning based. Some of it's just straight up code aut automation. And so we're not letting go of people. We're not really hiring either. Not to, not to the levels that you would expect for a company of our size and our revenue. So if we go back to the original question of what does the CEO, what does the C-suite need to know about large language models? There's a lot of work that needs to be done before you can answer that question. But if you get asked that question, the best way to approach it is to talk through the use cases of a large language model rather than trying to describe what composes a large language model, where the data comes from, how the tokens work, how you fine tune it, where the biases exist. Start with the use cases and then that should lead into the conversation of what is it that you, the CEO, are trying to achieve by bringing in artificial intelligence into this organization? What is your purpose? Exactly. Exactly. What is the purpose? And then where are where are the greatest needs? I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same question we've been asking people for you know, decades. Like, What keeps you awake at night? And the, when you start to decompose those problems, then you can start to see where there are opportunities to use any new technology, large language models, diffusers, transformers, whatever. You know, take the, the techno babble of your choice. If you decompose those problems into their component pieces and break them down into the five Ps, you can say, okay, here's where this technology is a good fit. And more importantly, here's where this technology is not a good fit. And it's not going to make things better because one of the problems with shiny object syndrome that a lot of people have, or I call it airline magazine syndrome, is you think that a tool can be used for everything. And it's good to try. It's good to 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 do that exercise of, okay, you know, could I try this? But mm -hmm. you will find out very quickly. Yes, yeah, there's there are plenty of situations where it is just not a good fit. You know, just like the blender, there are plenty of situations where there are foods you should just not blend. You know, spaghetti and meatballs, don't cook it in a blender. Mm -mm. No, I hadn't even considered that one. <laughs> now you got me thinking. No, I won't do that. You I can for do the most tomato part, sauce in the blender. That's right. I for the most part stay away from kitchen appliances. It's you know, I can bake, but for the most part, I just don't touch anything with sharp edges in general. It's safer <laughs> for everyone. On that note, if you have comments or questions or things that you want to talk about when it comes to the, the intelligent use of AI, pop by our free Slack group. Go to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers where you and 3,300 other professionals are asking and answering each other's questions every single day. And wherever it is that you watch or listen to the show, if there's a channel you'd rather have it on instead, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast. Thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you next time.